Good afternoon. I do hope that everyone can see me. I am never quite certain as to whether I am visible to everyone. For you see, I am what you might call a spirit, an apparition, a ghost. Why, some have even called me an angel. But I prefer to see myself as a messenger. The message I bear is just as important today in your time as it was in my time. During that great conflagration known as the American Civil War. My name is Mrs. Cordelia Harvey. My dear husband, Lewis Powell Harvey, was the governor of the great state of Wisconsin during that Civil War. I was born Cordelia Adelaide Perrin in upstate New York, near Buffalo. My father, John Perrin, was a very successful farmer, but he had read about the verdant, rolling farmland in a faraway place called the Territory of Wisconsin. My father decided to purchase land in the Wisconsin Territory. He removed the family to the southeastern corner of what is now the state of Wisconsin. He purchased land on the shores of Lake Michigan near a small community called Southport. I have since heard that the name of that community has been changed to Kenosha. I was trained as a schoolmistress. I was able to secure a position in a small private school in Southport. And there I met the young, handsome, energetic, ambitious Mr. Lewis Powell Harvey. He was the headmaster at the school. I hope you do not think poorly of me. <laughs> but we fell in love. We were married on November 4th of 1847. We settled there in Southport. Lewis seemed content to be a, a schoolmaster. But he had such great dreams, such ambitions. He decided to seek his fortune in the business world. We built a small store and a house in Chopier, Wisconsin, and settled into a very quiet life as shopkeepers. Our union was blessed with one child, a daughter, Mary. But sadly, our little one only survived two years. Upon her death, Lewis and I were shattered. We clung to one another in our grief, but we knew we must go on. Well, Lewis continued in the business world. He began to invest in mills around the new state of Wisconsin. It seemed as though everything Lewis touched turned to pure gold. He was an overwhelming business success. He then became interested in politics. He was elected to various minor positions, and then eventually elected as the Attorney General of the state of Wisconsin. And in November of 1862, my dearest Lewis was elected as the governor of the state of Wisconsin. 
Shortly after his inauguration, it was in April of 1863, a great battle would occur in a place little known to those in Wisconsin, a place called Shiloh, Tennessee. Our brave Wisconsin boys were fighting for the cause of the Union in faraway Tennessee. Within days of the battle, Lewis and several wealthy businessmen in Wisconsin decided that it was necessary to take supplies to our dear fighting boys in blue. And Lewis, with about 90 other gentlemen, organized the collection of blankets, medicine, clothing, and food for our dear boys. They organized wagon trains, rented flatboats to take those needed supplies to our dear soldiers. Along the way, Lewis stopped at many camps and hospitals, cheering the men, bringing them items from home, bringing them medicine and food and clothing, and sometimes, more importantly, a letter from home. Lewis traveled with the gentleman down to Memphis, Tennessee, and then to Shiloh and Pittsburgh Landing. Late one night, the men were unloading one of the flatboats. It was very late on a moonless night. The loading and unloading of the flatboats had to be done at night since there were still very many Confederate units in the area. Lewis lost his footing. He slipped into the dark, raging, spring-swollen waters of the Tennessee River. A young physician from Racine, Wisconsin, a Dr. Wilson, reached out his walking stick in an attempt to help the governor, but to no avail. Another young physician from Wilson, Wilton, Wisconsin, tethered himself to the boat, leapt into the waters in an effort to save the governor. But it was too late. Lewis's body had been swept underneath the flatboat. His body was not found for about 14 days, 65 miles downriver. There were some children playing on the bank, and they saw the body. One of the children went back to his father's farm and fetched a slave. The slave came to the riverbank and waded into the water, took the identification papers from the body, and then unceremoniously tossed Lewis back into the water. The slave went to his master, Mr. Chatterton. Mr. Chatterton read the identification papers, realizing that this was the body of the governor of the state of Wisconsin. Mr. Chatterton, with several other gentlemen from the area, took a wagon to the riverbank, retrieved the governor's body. Mr. Chatterton took the body back to his farm, had it prepared for burial, placed in a coffin, storing it in the ice house. He contacted the authorities in Madison, Wisconsin, a contingent of Wisconsin infantry officers came to retrieve the governor. Lewis was taken back to Madison and given a state burial and interred at the Forest Hill Cemetery in Madison. When my friends gathered around me to tell me of the news of my dearest Lewis, at first they spared me the lurid details, but I, I was lost in my grief. I was rudderless. I had no point, no goal, nothing to live for. Well, there were times when I walked along a river bank and I looked into those waters and I thought, perhaps it might be best if I shared in Lewis's fate. But my faith would not allow such thoughts and I knew that Lewis would not allow such thoughts. I returned to my home. I recall lying there on the bed, weeping for hours. 
And as the dawn came, I realized what I must do. I must pick up that mantle that was laid down by my husband. I must care for our dear soldier boys. And so I lobbied the new governor, Governor Solomon. I asked that I be appointed to the Western District Sanitary Commission as a hospital inspector. I was appointed. And so my career as a hospital inspector began. And what I found was appalling. These were not hospitals. They were mere tents, some of them without sides, so that the elements might affect our dear, suffering, wounded, and sick soldiers. And the people who cared for our soldiers, they were the dregs of society. Drunkards, women of the street, criminals. They often charged our dear soldiers for a drink of water or even a bit of food. And the bakers who would sell bread to the army, to these hospitals, they would cut their flour. 75% flour and 25% sawdust. And our young men were expected to recover from their wounds and from grave illnesses to be returned to the battlefield. These hospitals, the filth was unimaginable. Hard packed dirt. Every manner of vermin crawled through those hospitals. Often they would cover the dirt with loose boards, only giving better protection for the vermin beneath. In one hospital, I saw in the corners piled refuse four and five feet high, all manner of waste, filthy bandages, and often severed limbs. And the stench in these hospitals, as I walked through those narrow aisles, the cots barely an arm's length between, the stench clung in my nostrils. It permeated every stitch of my clothing. And there lay our poor suffering soldiers on these filthy narrow cots maggot-infested, bloody bandages upon their sick bodies. I was not the kind of inspector who came into the hospital with handkerchief over my nose, rushing through to the fresh air and proclaiming, you're doing a fine job, keep up the good work. No, I insisted that our soldiers deserved better. On one occasion, I had found out that a young boy, nearly 18 years of age, he was the son of a Methodist minister from Bayfield, Wisconsin. That young man had died from pneumonia because the physician on duty was too drunk to remove himself from his bed and tend his patient. On one occasion, as I walked through those narrow confines, I came across a young boy, perhaps only 16 years of age. His eyes swathed in filthy bandages covered with flies and maggots. He reached out a skeletal hand and clung to my skirt. In a thread thin voice, he called out, Mama, is that you, Mama? I replied, Yes, dear boy, it's Mama. I'm here to look after you. The boy's grip released. He laid back to his cot and expired. This is what I saw in those hospitals. I went to the commanding officers. I went to the highest generals. I told them we, we must make conditions better for our dear soldiers. My plan was that if we were to build hospitals, homes for these soldiers in the north, that we could bring the soldiers to the north and they would recuperate in the bracing northern air rather than in the fetid swamps of the south. But I was told, no. The moment we take those soldiers north, they will desert. 
I did not believe that. I knew that our boys were true and good and loyal. I knew they would not desert. I went to the highest officers to no avail. I met General Grant, General Sherman, and I was told the same thing. No, the boys would desert. I did not know where to turn. But then I realized I must go to the citizens of the state of Wisconsin, for they are generous and great of heart, and I knew that they would help our boys. And they answered my call. All over from the state of Wisconsin, food and clothing and medicine poured into the Chicago office of the Sanitary Commission. We packed box after box, sending it to our dear boys. I became acquainted with a lady in Chicago by the name of Mrs. Elijah Cook. Her husband was the president of a large bank in Chicago. She convinced her husband that he should become an administrator in the Chicago hospital and in the district commission office. He reorganized everything in these facilities. Soon, with Mr. Cook's help, we were sending 200 of these boxes filled with food, clothing, and medicine every week to our dear fighting boys. And the citizens of Wisconsin, the farmers of Wisconsin, they answered my call. From all over the state, we received food. From Door County, all the way from Bayfield to Bristol, we received jars of cherries. We had a river of cherries flowing to our fighting boys in blue. Sometimes our boys would ask if some or fortifying drink might be sent to them for medicinal purposes, perhaps some brandy or whiskey. Well, we did send that brandy and whiskey, but very often our boys would note that it never made that final destination. And so our ladies solved the problem. They would place the brandy or whiskey within the jars of fruit. Our boys would receive a sweet treat of the fruit and the fortifying drink they had requested. From every corner of Wisconsin, we received goods for our boys. The ladies knitted mittens and socks, for it will not always be summer. The boys will need warm things for the winter. And the ladies, they would organize social circles, collect money by selling baked goods and clothing made at home. Many of the ladies would purchase boxes of medicine such as this, with all of the medicine that a physician might need on a day-to-day -day basis to help our dear boys. And from the German communities in Wisconsin, from Milwaukee, and from Freestadt, we received sauerkraut. And sauerkraut, you ask? Well, it travels well. And the doctors noted that sauerkraut would stem the viciousness of a disease called scurvy, a disease in which the hair, the teeth fall out. The person becomes unable to walk, and death can ensue. But it was sauerkraut, the magic that would change that disease to health. All over the state of Wisconsin came the report, the citizens answered my call. I would meet again in Vicksburg, Mississippi with General Grant. I again laid out my plan for the hospitals in the North. Same answer. He listened patiently to me, then shook his head. Nope, won't work. Minute we get those boys North, they'll desert. I insisted, but to no avail. While I was in Vicksburg, I contracted malaria. 
I had the privilege of returning to the bracing northern air of Wisconsin to recover. And then I decided that I would visit family in New York while I recuperated. I thought, I must go to the very top. I must speak to the president himself. And so I began writing letter after letter to Mr. Lincoln. Most went unanswered. But then finally, one day, I received a letter from Mr. Hay, Mr. Lincoln's secretary. He said that if I could be in Washington at such and such a day and, and at that such and such a time, that he could guarantee an audience with the president. Oh, I would indeed be in Washington. Oh, I remember pacing all night long in my hotel room the night before my appointment. You see, I had kept a ledger of all the boys I had met while I was inspecting the hospitals. I had their names, the wounds, the dates of their discharge. Sometimes it was the date of their death. I would show Mr. Lincoln my ledger. Oh, I paced all night long. I rehearsed over and over again exactly what I would say to Mr. Lincoln. As I walked down the street to the president's house, women passed me in the street, clothed in black with heavy veils, many of them rushing ahead with handful of papers, asking strangers on the streets if they perhaps knew the whereabouts of a loved one. It was a sea of black, of suffering. When I arrived at the president's house, I was escorted down a long hallway, and there was the door to the president's office. Oh, I wish I had not bound myself so tightly this morning. I could scarcely breathe. I knocked at the door. A rather high-pitched voice answered from within. Who is it? I replied, it's Mrs. Harvey of Wisconsin. There was a long pause. The voice replied, come in. I entered the office and there was Mr. Lincoln. He, he was seated at his desk in his shirt sleeves. He did not rise when I entered. He looked at me over his spectacles. As I approached his desk, he looked at me and said, huh. So you are the Mrs. Harvey I've heard so much about. I replied, yes, sir. That's the Mrs. Harvey. And then suddenly, I cannot explain what came over me, but suddenly there I was shaking this ledger under the nose of the President of the United States and shouting at him. I was screeching. And then, Mr. Lincoln, he, he stretched out his spidery hands on the desk. I noticed that there were ink stains on his right hand and his shirt cuff. He pushed himself up from the desk and he went behind the desk to a table covered with papers. He picked up a handful of the papers. He stepped toward me. And then he began shaking those papers under my nose, and he shouted at me, My dear woman, I do not need you to come in here and tell me about casualties. Every day from the war office I receive these lists of casualties. You want numbers, you want statistics, I have them. I do not need you to come in here and tell me. 
Oh, I knew that, I knew that our interview had ended. I, I had destroyed any chance of having the president listen to my plan. I began to back out of the room. I was afraid to turn my back to him. I backed to the doorway and I stopped. I, I looked at Mr. President. He had seated himself again behind his desk and I, I said, oh, my dear sir, I did not mean to add a featherweight to your already overburdened shoulders. I wish I had stayed at home. Mr. Lincoln looked at me again over his spectacles and replied, I wish you'd stayed at home too. Oh, as I went back to my hotel, I knew, I knew that I had destroyed every chance. But I could not, I could not allow to see these boys suffer. I decided that I must keep writing to the president, begging him. Well, I would meet four more times with dear Mr. Lincoln. He listened very carefully to my plan. On my last visit with Mr. Lincoln, it was in February of 1865. By then, we had become friends. That day we chatted about, oh, family and friends, acquaintances. And then Mr. Lincoln sat down at his desk and he pulled out a sheet of blank paper. He picked up his pen and he wrote out the executive order for the building of three veterans hospitals in the state of Wisconsin. One on the banks of the Mississippi in Prairie du Chien, one in the capital of Madison, and one in Milwaukee. I had achieved my goal. That day as I left him, he walked me to the door. We stood there for a moment and he looked down at me and said, you know, you remind me of a little lady who lives upstairs. She won't give up until she gets what she wants. <laughs> As I left Mr. Lincoln that day and I, I walked down the hallway, he called to me. I turned and he said, Now tell me, Mrs. Harvey, you do think me remarkably handsome, don't you? <laughs> I replied, Yes, Mr. President, you are exquisitely handsome. Little did I know that that would be the last time that I would see our dear president alive. For in just a few weeks, our dear Mr. Lincoln would be cut down by an assassin's bullet. But I, I had achieved what I had set out to do. My dear soldiers would be cared for. I returned to Madison, Wisconsin, but I longed for upstate New York, for old friends and family. I returned to upstate New York and I settled into a quiet, comfortable life. I resumed my teaching career. I became a Sunday school teacher at a Methodist church there. I met a very fine gentleman the Reverend Albert Chester. He was widowed with six grown daughters. We married. It was a marriage of companionship, friendship. Dear Reverend Chester would also leave me. He was laid to rest next to his first wife and, and one of his daughters. I then decided that I would return to Clinton, Wisconsin, many years before 
My dear Lewis and I had built a home there in Clinton. Our daughter was born in that house. And so I went back to Clinton, Wisconsin, and again began teaching Sunday school. I was content. One afternoon, it was February, the um, 28th of February, 1895. It was a very warm day in Wisconsin, a very pleasant day. The warm sun was so comforting. I decided that I would sit on the porch and that was when my life ended. It, it was not difficult nor painful. It was, it was as though a shadow passing or a, a cloud passing overhead. I was laid to rest next to my dearest Lewis. I was reunited with my little daughter, Mary. I had achieved all that I set out to do. I recall the words of our dear Mr. Lincoln in his second inaugural address. We must bind up the nation's wounds, care for those who have borne the battle, care for his widow and orphans. I had set out to do just that, but the task is not complete. I have left my legacy, but the rest is up to you. For if there is only one soldier in need, one soldier in need of comfort and care, the task is not complete. And I leave that to you. Thank you.